so happy to be here with you ladies again tonight. It's November 3rd, and I've been looking forward to November 3rd for a really long time. It's a really big day because it's the peak of the rut. It's the peak of the rut. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, the peak of the rut is the beginning. Today's the beginning of it when the mama deer are in heat and the big giant Boone and Crockett bucks are ready to go and find a mate, and it is the most best opportunity to get yourself a Boone and Crockett buck on your wall. It's the peak of the rut, November 3rd to about November 11 or 12, so very, very exciting and sacred days in the Bergsma household. So if you had told me 20 years ago that I would be excited about the peak of the rut, or that I even knew what that was, I would, I'd probably just say, well, what's the peak of the rut? And if you had told me 20 years ago that I would look at the weather for this weekend and see that it's going to be 70 degrees, and I would say, it can't be 70 degrees. It's the peak of the rut. And that shuts down the deer activity. And my husband, he, he needs a north wind. We can't have a south wind. This, this is not good. This is not good. If I was someone who, who would actually care about, who, who would complain about warm weather in November, like, that's not who I am. Like, bring on the warm weather. So if you had told me that 20 years ago, I would just been like, you are insane. You have no idea who you're talking to. But alas, I have changed, and I am honestly sad about the warm weather, which I know none of you are, but I am. But hopefully my husband still gets that Boone and Crockett buck. We're hoping. So in the same way, if you had told me 20 years ago about that, and in the same way, if you had told me 20 years ago that I'd be up here and that I'd be teaching the Word of God, and that I would be so passionate about seeing men and women walk in their position in Christ and walk in their freedom, I, would have, I wouldn't have had words for that. I just, that's not something I could have comprehended 20 years ago. And it is because of Ephesians 2 that my life has been transformed. And so I am so excited to dig into that word with you tonight. So with that, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these women. I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak through me your words, not my words, Lord. I pray that you would give us all soft, pliable hearts to hear your truths. God, that you would break down barrier walls that we might put up to resistance, Lord, and that you would speak personally to each one of us your word. And we just thank you for this opportunity that we get to share your word. In your beautiful name I pray, amen. All right, so we are going to dig into Ephesians 2, page 61 of your notes, as we discovered. And if you would like to look at the uh, scriptures, they are on page 48. I'm going to put them up here for you. I'm using the NASB in your book. It's the NIV, but it should be pretty comparable. So before we dig in to Ephesians 2, we really need to remember what we've learned so far. So Charlene beautifully taught two weeks ago about our identity, that we're chosen, that we're loved, that we're accepted, that we're worthy. And we learned that, uh, that we are adopted in that adoption as daughters, that it's part of God's overarching design and plan to redeem and store, restore humanity. And then we learned that we have a holy calling. We learned that we're his inheritance. We learned that we have incomparable great power. And then we learned that Jesus Christ is above all things, above every principality, above every power, that, that thesis in Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23, that Jesus Christ is king of kings. He's king of kings. And now Paul's going into Ephesians 2. And in Ephesians 2, Paul is going to prove Jesus' kingship and his victory over the enemy, over the powers, by showing us what Christ has done. So in Ephesians 2, Paul shows us how God has acted powerfully and radically in Christ to begin setting the world right. He has acted powerfully and radically to set the world right. So we're going to dig right on in. Ephesians 2 is basically broken into two sections, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, and then 11 through 22. So we're going to begin with Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, which shows how God has acted to free us, to free us from death and enslavement. So Ephesians 2, 1, it says, And you were dead 
in your offenses and sin in which you previously walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath. So I asked this in your homework. I said, what can a dead person do to become undead? Can I like muster myself out of the grave? There is nothing I can do. I'm dead. There's nothing a dead person can do to become undead. We were spiritually dead and we were enslaved to sin. We were enslaved to the powers. We were, we were enslaved to our flesh, just following the ways of this world. We were absolutely enslaved. And, and I used to read this and I think like, oh yeah, like I, you know, like how Pastor Doug always says, you know, I don't, I used to drink and chew and do with those that do or whatever, but, but now I'm saved and I'm good. Like, yay, yay God, like, but God, you saved me. And I had a really, really cheap understanding of sin and how enslaved I was. And it led to a cheap understanding of grace, just a cheap understanding of grace. And, and, and a low view of sin, it leads to a low view of the cross. It leads to a low view of the cross. But when, when, we can, when we can see how enslaved we are, that, that will give us 100% dependency on Jesus. And it gives us a greater dependence, a greater love for God. And we just fall more and more in love with him because we realized how unable we were to free ourselves and how, on, how enslaved we were. See, and what, what God freed me from, what God freed us from, it's not just outward behaviors. Goodness, my sin was me finding my worth in anything but God. It's thinking I can be satisfied in a job or a ministry or in parenting. It's believing that my worth comes from a status, maybe a status of, you know, if I just got married, if I just have kids, if I just got that job, if I just got that validation from that person, if I just got that approval, thinking that that would fill me. And that it, it led to this enslavement because I tried over and over and over again to find my satisfaction in this world and the people of this world. I was, I was worshiping the ways of this world and I was completely unable to break free in my own strength. And in all my sin, and all my trying in my own strength, trying to be like God, worshiping myself, living for myself, living for my comfort, thinking I can just do it all on my own, my, having that need to be in control, or maybe just turning to Netflix to numb out, or turning to addictions, to alcohol, to drugs, to books, turning to men, thinking a man can satisfy me, and all of that, and all of that, we've got a but, God. But God, I am so thankful for a but God. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, some of the most beautiful scriptures. It says, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, he made us alive together with Christ. And I love that, how it's in parentheses. It's like Paul just has to put it in. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. And we underline mercy, great love, and grace because God, overdriven by his, how his great mercy and his great love and his great power, he acted radically, radically by his mercy, great love, and grace to save us. He acted radically to save us and to transform us because of his grace and his mercy and his love. And then he not only acted to save us, he did three things. We got three verbs that he did here. He made us alive together with Christ, raised us up with Christ, and seated us with Christ in heavenly places. 
These are past tense verbs, raised, seated, it's done, it's finished. He raised you up with Christ, seated you with Christ. And see, when I began to understand how enslaved I was, how unable I was to free myself, and then I began to understand what it meant that I was made alive with Christ, that I'm one with Christ, and that I'm raised up with Christ, and that I'm seated with Christ. That, that is when my life changed. That is when I began to walk in the freedom that Christ died for me to have. That is when everything changed. And that is why I care so much that we all know our position in Christ and that we all live and walk in that position. Because a woman who knows that she's made alive with Christ and raised with Christ and seated with Christ and a woman who lives from that position, she is a scary woman to the enemy. She is a powerful woman. She she is a woman who, she doesn't get offended by the ways of this world. She's a woman who's not stuck in comparison. She's not stuck in competition. She's not looking to men to fill her. When things go wrong, she doesn't fall apart. She doesn't lay in bed for two weeks when she's hurt. She, She doesn't even get hurt as much as she used to because she is so secure in Christ. And then she wants the whole world to know the goodness and the mercy of God. And so she is running and she is taking risks for the kingdom of God. That is a powerful woman. We have been made alive with Christ, raised up with him, and seated with Christ. Y'all, this is who we are. And these, we are powerful women in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done. So I want us to look at exactly what it means to be made alive with Christ seated with Christ and raised with Christ. So I've got a diagram here that I'm going to go over, and I will send this out to you in a PDF as well. But we're going to go over this. So here we've got the cross here in the black. This is the cross. So this is pre-cross. This is post-cross. So we're going to go over pre-cross first. So we have the highest heaven. Highest heaven, God in Christ, Holy Spirit. So these are our Ephesians verses that just kind of back those up. Ephesians 1, 20 through 21, 4, 30, talk about that. God and Christ in the highest heaven. And then we have the lowest heaven, and we've got the evil powers that we're talking about, the powers in the principalities that are causing oppression and enslavement. We've got the, in the lowest heaven. And then we have the earth below. We've got humans. So this is pre-cross. This is kind of what life looked like, pre-cross. But see, Christ... He came down to the lowest place. He became a human, and he suffered a brutal death on the cross. But because there was no sin in him, he broke the power of sin, and he was raised up, and he was exalted to the highest place. And we needed a human that could go to the lowest place and then be exalted to the highest place. And then I'm going to switch sides here. So this is what our current reality looks like. It says Christ and believers in Christ. That's what we just read, Ephesians 2, 6. You have been raised up with Christ. So God, Christ, believers in Christ. So, so this is where we are. Positionally, this is where we are. We are seated in heavenly places. But we don't always feel like we're experiencing those heavenly places. It doesn't always feel like we're in heavenly places. And that's because we live a two dimensional life. We're still, we've got unbelievers and the believers still on earth. So my my flesh, my body, I'm here, but my spirit is here. Positionally, I'm here. But see, notice, until Jesus comes back, we've, we've still got the evil powers. We still have the powers and principalities. Remember from week one, that's who our war is against, powers and principalities. We've still got them. And they're still causing havoc. They're still causing oppression. They're still causing enslavement. So if we don't have Christ, we, we're not even, we, if we're unbelievers, we, this isn't even an opportunity for us. But believers, we, we can live here or we can live here. So we're going to leave this up for a little bit as I continue to talk through it. But I think we all kind of want to figure out how, how do we, 
how do I live up here? Like, you're saying, oh, I'm seated in heavenly places. Oh, well, now I know what that means, but how, how do I live up here? How do I live up here? And Romans 6, 7, 8, I would recommend go home, read those. They talk so much about how we live from our heavenly position. But Romans 6 says that you have been crucified with Christ. So you've been crucified with Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, old creation is gone, new creation is here. So you're a new creation in Christ. But my flesh, the, this girl who, who still wants to go her own way, that didn't get crucified. That didn't get crucified. So I've got this new spirit, this new life in Christ, and I want to live from this new spirit so that I'm not down here with the powers and living in my own strength. So how do I live up there? And really, it's, it's kind of what we've talked about the last two weeks. That's why I love going through the book of the Bible. Because Charlene taught us about our identity in Christ. And so I have to identify with who I am in Christ. How, how can I live up here if, if I believe my worth comes from the world? How can I live up here if I, I'm looking to other people to have acceptance? We have to identify with who we are in Christ. And then what Emily said last week, we die to self. Now, our old person, the old man has died, but we still got that flesh and we got to die to that flesh and we have to die to self. And we do that by surrendering and living obedient lives. We, we die to self. We live in surrender in obedience. And in order to to have be surrendered and to be obedient, we, we got to die to pride. We got to die to look into other people to fill our needs. We got to die to look into, you know, maybe my leader made me upset. So, you know, that now they failed because we're looking to them to, to, to be our hero. We're looking to them to be our savior. We're looking to our husbands or our boyfriends or our friends to be our savior. And that's why we're struggling and we're in this hurt because we're not going to Jesus. See, we have to die to self and know my worth and my dignity and everything. It comes from who Jesus says I am. So to live up there, we've got to identify with who we are and we've got to die to self, surrender. And see, I, I can choose how I'm going to live. I, I can... I can just live in my own strength, do my own thing, and, and I'll be down here, and it's not going to change my worth. It's not going to change my value. It's not going to change my acceptance. Jesus says we are worthy. We are in Christ. That, that's not going to change, but it is going to change your power. Your power. And we don't, I, I want to I have resurrection power. I want to go to difficult places. It's going to change our power. So I want to show you. I've got a flashlight here. And I turn it on, and I, I've got no power. Well, it's because I don't have a battery. Well, you ask Jesus into your heart. So I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to live for you. You've got the life of Christ. You've got the life of Christ. And all of a sudden, you've got this resurrection, amazing power but there's no power. There's no light. See, because to live up here, we, we got to turn it on. We got to identify with who we are. We've got to die to self, die to needing to be right all the time, die to needing to be understood all the time, die to needing to find my acceptance in other people. But when we do that, see that? We've got power. We've got resurrection power. And we're bringing his light to a broken and dying world. So you, you, you've got Christ in you. You've got Christ in you. You're accepted. You're worthy. You're valued. But we're not always living from it. Because we're not living obediently by surrendering to his kingdom and to his plan. So if we identify with who we are, because, goodness, I cannot surrender if, I'm, if I don't believe that my acceptance and my worth comes from Christ. Then there's no way I can surrender and be obedient because in, in the deepest places of my soul, I am trying to find worth and I am trying to be loved and I'm going to look to it in the world. So the only way I can live in these heavenly places is to identify what Charlene said, to identify with who we are in Christ. And if you're looking at this today and you're saying, goodness, I don't, 
I don't even know. I don't even know if I have the life of Christ to live from. Then I want to talk to you after this, and I'm going to be here, and I want to talk to you about making Jesus Christ the Savior and Lord of your life. So come and find me afterwards. Isn't that so beautiful? What a God we serve. Made us alive with Christ, raised us, and seated us. And then verse 7 shows us the purpose of why he did this, why he made us alive, raised us, and seated us. Ephesians 2, 7 says, So that in the ages to come he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So it's not, it's not just for today. It's, it's not just for me, my freedom. It's not just for me. But it's so that God can just show his goodness and he's just continuing to pour it out, his goodness and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then we're moving on to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It's a gift. We don't pay it back. You can't pay back a gift. It's a gift so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We are his workmanship. I hope you saw in your homework this week the Greek word for that is poema. Poema, work of art, work of poetry. You are his poema. Poema, it's so beautiful. And, and, and I went from walking in darkness, Ephesians 2, 1, enslaved to sin, walking in darkness, to being raised up, seated, made alive with Christ, to all of a sudden, now these, these works, they're just they're pouring out of me. It's not because I have to pay it back. It's not because I have to earn anything. It's because God is so good and because I'm with him and I'm one with him that I want the whole world to know his goodness. And we walk in those good works because anyone who is saved by that, that, that God who has acted radically to transform us and to free us is going to pour out good works. They are going to pour out of them. We are his poema. We are his poema. What a God we serve. It is beyond my imagination that our God would take us from completely enslaved, not deserving, dead, to creating his poema. Poema. Oh, so good. He's so good. So that is our first cycle of what we would call divine warfare, how God has defeated the enemy. He's freed us from enslavement. And then our second cycle of divine warfare is in Ephesians 2, 11 through 18. See, salvation, it's, it's not just a ticket to heaven. Salvation is entrance into fellowship with God Fellowship with God and fellowship with one another. Reconciliation to God and reconciliation to one another. And that's what Ephesians 2, 11 through 22 shows us. So in Ephesians 2, 11 through 12, again, just like in 1 through 3, we see the problem. This is the problem. Therefore, remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember, at that time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from the people of Israel, strangers to the covenants of the promise, having no hope without God in the world. So the Gentiles are excluded from the people of God, They're strangers to the covenants. They have no hope. They're without God in the world. That's our problem. But we've got a three-letter word in verse 13. But... But God. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who previously were far away have been brought near 
by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. He is our peace. He made both groups, made them one, made them one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which is the law composed of commandments, expressed in ordinances, so that in himself he might make two people one, one new person, in this way establishing peace, and that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death their hostility. That's a whole lot of confusing scripture if you ask me. <laughs> I first looked at that and I was like, what is this saying? All right, so we're going to kind of summarize it, but we see that the dividing factor here between Jews and Gentiles is the Mosaic law. Now, I would love to have like this really nerdy theological conversation with you about the Mosaic Law and why it was the dividing factor and why it caused hostility. Like, that's my idea of a good time, but I have a feeling maybe it's not yours. So, <laughs> for the sake of time, we're going to keep moving on, but we need to know the dividing wall was the Mosaic Law that separated the Jews and Gentiles. And it's a metaphor to illustrate the hostility and the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. But by the power of the cross, so this is part of salvation, this is part of it. It's not just for me, it's reconciliation to one another. So by the power of the cross, Jesus destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. Do we have any dividing walls of hostility right now? Yeah, like go on social media for 2.1 seconds. Whew, we have got some dividing walls of hostility. We're so divisive right now. Politics are dividing us. Race is dividing us. Beliefs are dividing us. Goodness, even masks are dividing us. But because of the cross, our ethnic culture, our political affiliations, our economic class, they all become subculture to our kingdom culture, to our kingdom culture. And these Jews and Gentiles who generally hated one another, they became one new humanity, the church, the church of Christ, in Christ. And see, it's not just like, oh, hey, we're going to tolerate, or you need to become like a Jew, or you need to become like a Gentile. No, they all became like Christ. They became one one new humanity. And so today, it's not, you know what? The Democrats need to become like the Republicans or the Republicans need to become like the Democrats. No, we all need to become like Christ. We all need to become like Christ. And we cannot war in the spirit if we are warring one another, right? We cannot war in the spirit if we're fighting one another. And next week, you're going to learn that God is displaying his victory through the unity of the church. The church needs to come together. And I know it is, it's complex. I get it. It's complex and it's hard. And, and there's, just, there's a lot of difficult conversations. And I know it is so complex. But you guys, we've got the resurrection power of Jesus. And if I'm not willing to go to those complex and hard places and those hard conversations, then I am minimizing the power of of Jesus. We can go to those places and we can push for unity for the kingdom of God. Are we living in a way that we believe in the power of the cross? The power that not only freed me from my enslavement, but reconciled humanity to one another. See, Jesus, he, he broke down the barrier wall. The devil, the powers, the principalities, they have no power to divide us. They have no power to divide us. And if, and if we're living from our resurrection power, right, if we're, if we're living from that place of being seated in heavenly places, we're going to have power and we're going to bring light to darkness and they will not be able to divide us. And you guys, no matter what happens today, the kingdom of God is going to advance. It's not on the line. The kingdom of God is not on the line. Guys, and we need to come together because Jesus is our peace. And united, it doesn't mean that we all look the same way. It doesn't mean we all vote the same way. It means that we become like Jesus. We become like Jesus, not each other. It means that we're a new people. We're the church. We're the church, the new humanity that God created when he, he died to them, that the new humanity that's going to die to themselves and who were raised up with Christ. 
the new humanity that is to be the location because we are in Christ. So we are the location where God is encountered. The location where God is encountered. We are bringing God's presence to a lost and dying world by how we live, by how we lay down our lives and serve like Jesus served. And that's why Paul states next that we are the temple of God. We are the temple of God. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. So then, you are no longer strangers and citizens, but you are fellow citizens, or foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fit together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now remember, Paul is talking about divine warfare, how God in Christ has defeated the powers. And in that day, when a nation would conquer another nation, they would gather at that temple and they would worship their God and, and they would take their little, you know, idol, little lowercase g God and they'd put him in the temple to symbolize what they believed happened in the heavenly realms. But here we see we don't gather at a temple. We gather as the temple. We gather as the temple of Christ. And the way that we live our lives corporately together, together in unity is reflecting the goodness of God. Yes, I am a temple. Yes, you are a temple. But our lives together matter. How we live together with one another is reflecting the goodness of God. And as believers joined to Christ, one with Christ, raised with Christ, seated with Christ, you are a living breathing, walking, talking temple in which God dwells by his spirit. You are a carrier of the presence of God. A carrier of the presence of God. And as the gospel is proclaimed and embraced, lives are going to be healed and they're going to be made whole. And that's what I want to see us all walking in that freedom and walking in that position I said week one, the story of Ephesians is the story of how God in Christ has redeemed humanity from sin and how he created a new people, a new people, us, the church, empowered by the Spirit. That's everything we just went over. It's everything we just went over. We've been redeemed from sin. The, bro the barrier wall is broken. It is broken, and he has created a new people, his temple, who bring his presence to the world. One day, God is going to dwell with all of creation, new temple. Oh, right now, don't we just long for that day? Just long for that day. But until that day, we are the place where the world is encountering the one true God. We are the temple of God. As we share the gospel, as we love and serve one another, as we fight injustice from a place of humility, as we work together, we're engaging in spiritual warfare. As we live from Christ's life rather than our own strength, we're going to manifest his life to a broken and hurting world. You're redeemed from sin. You're raised up with Christ. You're seated in heavenly places. You're his poema. You're his work of art. And then the walls that divided you from others, they're torn down. In Jesus, there is no other. We are all one in Christ. And we know this is real because it's so backwards. It's so backwards. See, we don't, we don't need a platform to make a difference. We don't even need political power to make a difference. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. We have the power of God in us. And as we live from his life, as we come together corporately as the church of Christ, lives will be set free, chains will be broken, and lives will be healed and made whole. What a God we serve. So 
If that doesn't make you just want to stand and sing his praises, I don't know what does, but, but will you please, will you join me and will you sing loud because I want to just sing loud that we are glorifying the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator, the creator of the universe. He is Lord of heaven and Lord of earth.